Well, joining us now to break down the latest August jobs numbers, we've got Joe Brusuelos, who is the chief economist over at RSM, and we've got Peter Chur, who is the head of macro strategy at Academy Securities. They've been sitting here just waiting to chime in on this discussion, and it's great to see both of you once again here to help break down some of this data. Uh, Joe, you're to my right here. First and foremost, I mean, you see a print like this come out weaker than expected on that headline non-farm payroll number, but as expected, largely on the unemployment rate figure. What does that signal to you? All right, so when I took my first look at the data, my sense was is that we got the downward revision last month, but we got an upswing of over 50,000. This looks like what we saw in July mm -hmm. was largely due to seasonal factors, those temporary layoffs. Once we can get open the data set, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go look at straight at the household. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna see how many, what was going on in temporary layoffs in general, then in particular, I wanna see if there was an upswing in in people going back to work in the auto industry after seasonal retooling. If that's it, I'm gonna set July aside and say that's a seasonal uh, issue. That's not mean, that does not mean that we're, the labor market's turning over. It just means we're cooling. The 4.2% unemployment rate, well guys, this, this screams 25 basis points yeah. at the Fed. This, this report doesn't scream 50 basis points, right, on its surface. Peter? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the job, the unemployment rate is key. That's going to keep the Fed on hold. They're adjusting enough jobs this month, even with the downward revisions. So I think the market's going to have to digest probably only 25 in an only okay economy with people questioning AI. So I think you actually get a resumed sell-off today in the tech sector because they're not going to get the support they were looking for from the Fed. And there's still remaining questions about where the spending is going. And the economy is okay, but not great. I mean, that, that is the larger question of if tech would be, because of the run-up we've already seen in tech to this juncture, and whether or not it would actually continue to have more legs, because tech typically, to your point, is a beneficiary during a cutting cycle. So how much more legs to the tech trade if we go into this cutting cycle and there's already been so much gains to be held? I think we get back and test the August lows in tech. So I think you can have another 5 6% pullback in the NASDAQ 100. Then you start maybe getting some bottom feeders come in and say, OK, this is where it is. Because on top of this, we've got elections coming up that's very uncertain. There's definitely more and more questions about how much spending is really going, how the hyperscalers are doing. So to me, that's the vulnerable part. I do start liking the other market though. I think the rest of the market that's been lagging, you start nibbling at that. I think it gets pulled down by tech a little bit, but this is all telling you like we're not headed to a recession. It might be a bit bumpy. There might be parts of the economy that are shaky. Others are strong. I get comfortable owning the rest of the market with that. I want to go back to the macro with you, Joe, as you're kind of looking through the data. We saw payroll revisions over the yep. past two months down a total of 86,000. Does that tell you that there is more weakness than we might be initially perceiving in this headline number in the labor market? Not necessarily. It just confirms the cooling trend that we, we all identified. I, I don't think this is at risk, again, of, of the labor market just turning over. We're just going to cool. Remember, we only need to have about 100,000 a month to keep the unemployment rate stable. Okay, if you looked at the unemployment rate, which I just did while you were having a great conversation with Peter, 4.221. Mm -hmm. We narrowly missed a 4.2 <laughs> 4, 4 here, mm. right? When you, and there was 168,000 increase in the household, so we didn't have a split decision. We, we saw the household actually increase a little bit stronger than the, the top line. That, that's a sign to me that there, there was more seasonal noise going on in, in July. So what, we're gonna, what we should expect to see, though, going forward is the trend cooling towards about 100,000 a month. When you're at full employment, like the United States economy is, and that's a good thing, it's hard to actually generate a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just is, and they shouldn't because firms have been hoarding labor for a number of years. When we conducted our middle market survey for the third quarter of the year, it was absolutely rock solid everywhere except for hiring. Hiring is just going to slow because they just don't need to add on any more people. Moreover, given the productivity data we saw this week, 2.5% in the quarter, 2.7% on a year-ago basis, it's probably not a good idea for firms to begin to continue adding really large sums of labor every month because then that will hit their balance sheet. And that's not really how you want to manage where we're at, really, which is in the middle of the current business cycle. We've, and when you mentioned the labor hoarding, how, how quickly do you expect an unwinding of labor hoarding to the point where it shows up in the unemployment rate? Okay, well, we would need the economy to materially slow. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the Atlanta Fed's tracking model, which I think is the industry standard these days, it swings between two and two and a half percent. That's not consistent with discharging a lot of labor. Moreover, if you look at the pace of firings, 
It's really stable. My friend Aaron Sojourner uh, in Wisconsin, used to be a treasury official, looks at every single week at employment stability and security. The job security for Americans right now is stunning. I mean, you, you, if you have a job, you're really not at risk of losing it. Hmm. I want to go to you, Peter, on this. Yeah, what were you going to say? So one thing I've been doing is I really, and we'll go through this exercise this weekend, I only look at data from 2018 to 19 versus from the middle of 23 to now. I try and ignore all the noise that we saw through COVID, the COVID bombs, and you start looking at an economy that looks somewhat similar to 2018-19. Some parts are slightly worse, some parts are slightly better. I think on the jobs data, we got to look at the preponderance of evidence. You've got jolts down, but again, in line with where we were. Quits rates, hires rates, maybe slightly worse than 2018-19, but not horrible. Um, consumer still spending. So that to me, I think it's a good exercise to go through is compare this to 2018, 19, and you get less afraid than trying to compare it to that we're coming off from multi-year highs. You know, what, what, just one other yep. thing. Yep. We went through such an unusual shock, right? You know, the unemployment rate went to 14% for a brief period of time, and then stabilized really somewhere between six and 8% for a good long period of time. Right. This is the most unusual business cycle in anybody's memory. And trying to, and Pete's really spot on here, going back and looking at cycles in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s isn't really going to inform you about how this is likely to unfold. I, I think this is really, if you're out there trading or investing, right, or even if you're just watching because you're interested in the material affairs of the United States, I would not make the, the, the mistake of comparing what went on in those past business cycles to this because the residual seasonality and the noise is clearly distorting the data and we really can see this now. I liked though what you were saying, Joe, about we should expect kind of 100,000 moving yeah. forward, but I wanna get your take on how that could impact earnings because typically you see a nice straight line between hiring and earnings growth. So I think you're gonna see a slowdown in earnings. I think one of the things we're gonna face in big tech, a lot of the companies are facing more pressure from Chinese companies, not necessarily here, but you look at Germany, right? The biggest EV seller in Germany right now is Boyd or BYD, right? So you've got that pressure. I think you're gonna see some of that there. And again, when you look at our markets, you've got these really high PE, high value stocks that everyone's loved and adored. They've been momentum, they've been driving the index. Then you've got a lot of companies that you can actually pick up at a pretty reasonable level. So maybe if we kind of take our eyes away from the golden goose and say, what else is out there? I think that's where you get the next 20, 30% returns is finding those companies that have been undervalued that people say, hey, we're in a normal cash flow environment. These businesses can do well. Let's up small the- Small caps or? Small caps, value. I, I think that's the way, way to look right now. And so just lastly here, and I mentioned this going into the report and it was coming off of one of the notes that I was reading earlier this week from BlackRock about immigration and how that's playing its way into that. That's perhaps a, a differentiating factor in this economy versus any comparison that we would have had to cycles past here. Yeah, immigration is the secret sauce in both just how robust the growth was in the labor market over the past number of years. And in terms of growth, 3.5% last year. We're at 3.1% year over year through the end of June. That's very good. And another thing, I do think that that productivity number that we saw yesterday, mm -hmm. we need to go back and take a look at that because improved productivity means improved profits. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, especially if you're looking at the S&P 500 or the S&P 493, right? Those 493 stocks that didn't do all that well, but are starting to show signs of life. Well, they're just not as of life. Yeah. They're just not as magnificent. That's yeah. right, yeah. This is great. You both speak each other's language very well, Joe and Peter. So I know you've got a celebration to get to with your post jobs yeah. report dinner here. So we'll let you get to it. But thank you so much, both of you, for right, joining us you. on set. Peter Shear and Joe Bruce Willis joining us.